you got all kinds of problems up here, so it's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it through. Hey, I know we've got some guests who are with us today, so if you are a guest with us, thanks so much for being here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, um, on your way in this morning, my name is Bill, and it's my privilege to serve as the lead pastor here at the table. Um, you know, when you walk into a new church for the very first time, you may not know necessarily what to expect. You may have checked us out online first, and so you have some idea um, but we always consider it a privilege when we have new folks who join us in service every week. And regardless of where you are in your faith, if you're still exploring faith, trying to figure out what you really believe, or if you're ready because you just moved into the area from somewhere else, you're ready to, to you're looking for a church home, maybe looking to, uh, for a place to get connected and stuff like that, we want to help you take that next step in your faith. Um, and so if you hear anything this morning and you have questions about it or you just have questions about the church, I would love to be able to answer those questions for you. Uh, after the service this morning, I'll be out in the lobby. And so um, feel free to, to just stop by. And if I didn't get a chance to meet, you can introduce yourself and I can introduce myself to you. And um, if you have questions, I'd love to answer those. But if you are a guest with us for the very first time, we would love to connect with you. And the easiest way to do that is for you to, you to text the word WELCOME to 817-755-1668. So I said that really fast. I know it's on the screen. Well, it should, it's, it's not. Look what we have got. It was on the screen. Sharon put it on the screen. It's not there now, but it's on the sticker in front of you. Um, that number is there, so you can do that um, at any point in the service. And um, if you are a Uversion Bible app user, I'll give you the commercial for this now. Um, you can navigate your way to our live event and follow along there on the Uversion Bible app. So if you go down to the bottom, there's more, and then there's like a couple of sections, and the second section near the top of the second section is events. Um, just hit that button, and you'll find our events. You can follow along with the scripture and things like that. And then what happens is you can text us throughout the service, um, and I'll just think you're paying attention following along um, with your Uversion app or taking notes there and stuff like that, right? So um, it's not going to be distracting at all. I'll just think you're, you're, you're really, really paying attention to the message this morning. So uh, the other thing that we're doing today at the, uh, towards the end of the service is we are celebrating communion together. And so hopefully everyone picked up your um, communion elements on the way in. If you don't have those, didn't grab one on your way in, um, feel free to raise your hand now and we'll get those to you now. Um, so Courtney, all the way in the front row. It's good. So Wayne, if you can maybe get one for Courtney. Actually, I could just throw you mine, but I won't do that. Um, oh, goodness. Um, so we're going to do that at the end of the service this morning. So hold those, keep those handy. If you're not familiar with um, the cups that we have, I'll just explain them because Wayne's going to lead us in communion uh, this morning and he won't have to do this later. So you, to get to the bread, it's the clear cellophane on top. Do that first and then the um, like tin foil piece, then go down to that one. If you do it all at once, it's going to create all kinds of mess. So you don't want to do that. Um, I think that's it. I'm ready to, to get started. So let me pray for us and we'll jump into the message this morning. Father, thanks so much for the privilege of being able to gather together um, and to worship you. Um, and Father, as we spend some time in your word today, I pray that you would help us to understand all that you have accomplished for us through Jesus and that truth would change our lives. Um, so, Father, speak to us today. Um, continue to meet with us. Thank you for being with us in this moment. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may know the what, but do you know the why? Knowing the what is really important, but knowing the why, that's what can change your life. Over the last several weeks in this series that we've called Enough, we've been following Jesus first as he met with the disciples in the upper room. It was there they were celebrating the Passover, and Jesus was preparing his disciples for his imminent death. It was there that he instituted what we know as the Lord's Supper or communion to remind us of what he accomplished for us. From the upper room, they went to the garden. It was there in the garden that Jesus prayed if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, but yet not my will, but yours be done. And he also instructed the disciples to pray so that they wouldn't fall into temptation, but instead they fell asleep. Just after Jesus finished praying, he was met by another one of his disciples, one of the twelve, Judas, who came along with some of the religious leaders and some soldiers, and it was then that Jesus was arrested. 
He was first taken to the home of the high priest. That's where his questioning began. And it was outside in the courtyard that Peter, one of the closest followers of Jesus, one of the inner circle, one of the three, that's when he denied knowing Jesus on three separate occasions. Inside where the trial of Jesus began, he was in front of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. And basically, they asked him one question, are you the Son of God? And his response was, you say that I am. And in their minds, they had him. He was guilty. Guilty of blasphemy, claiming to be God, which was a crime in their minds that was punishable by death. But the problem was that the religious council didn't have the power to carry out the sentencing. That's why they had to get Rome's help. And so Jesus was then taken to Pilate. From there, you might know some of what took place. Jesus was mocked and beaten And ultimately, he was crucified, which was like the worst form of torturous death that anybody has ever conceived of. You may know the what, but do you really know the why? Knowing what Jesus did is really important, but yet at the same time, understanding really why Jesus endured what he endured, that's what can change our lives. I've kind of been frustrated by something that I feel like I've observed over some time, and it's not just with other people. Sometimes it's even in my own life, too. I think it's in the culture that we live in, it's really easy to just kind of go through the motions of faith. So you can say the right things, say that you believe the right things about Jesus, and maybe even do some of the right things, show up at church, you know, once every six weeks or sometimes more, um, may even serve in the church. You kind of default into doing the right things. But yet at the same time, it's like faith is not really guiding your life. It's not guiding everything that you do. And I think the reason that that so often happens is because we know the what, but we really don't understand the why. Because when we understand the why of all that Jesus did for us, that's when our faith can come alive and and, and faith begins to be that determining factor for everything that we do. And it's my hope and my prayer for all of us, for all of us who would consider the table to be our church home, that our faith would absolutely come alive. And may that happen today as we talk about the why. Because Jesus endured what he endured for us. If you do have a Bible, we're going to be looking at uh, the trial scene of Jesus in Luke chapter 23. We're going to look at Luke 23, 1 through 25, which is a a, a longer section, but I'm going to read it in its entirety, in part because I think that there is something special about reading Scripture aloud. And so as I read it, I, I want you to picture the scenes that take place for us. I want you to try to visualize in your mind all that's taking place um, as I read it. And there are three really scenes within the trial of Jesus that we're looking at today. First is Jesus before Pilate. The second scene takes place as Jesus goes in front of Herod. And then the third scene is when Jesus is returned back to Pilate again to receive his ultimate sentencing. So we'll work our way through that this morning, but let me read it. Luke chapter 23 starting in verse 1. Then their whole assembly rose up and brought him before Pilate. That whole assembly, it's the Sanhedrin that I referred to a second ago. So they brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, opposing payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. But Pilate then told the chief priests and the crowds, I find no ground for charging this man. But they kept insisting he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he started, even to here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. Finding that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who who was also in Jerusalem during those days. 
Herod was very glad to see Jesus. For a long time he had wanted to see him because he had heard about him and was hoping to see some miracle performed by him. So he kept asking him questions, but Jesus did not answer him. The chief priest and the scribe stood by vehemently accusing him. Then Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt, mocked him, dressed him in bright clothing, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Previously, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and he said to them, You have brought me this man as one who misleads the people, but in fact, after examining him in your presence, I have found no grounds to charge this man with those things you accuse him of. Neither has Herod, because he sent him back to us. Clearly, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will have him whipped and then release him. Then they all cried out together, Take this man away, release Barabbas to us. He had been thrown into prison for rebellion that had taken place in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why? What has this man done wrong? I found in him no grounds for, de- for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him whipped and then release him. But they kept up the pressure, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified, and their voices won out. So Pilate decided to grant their demand and then release the one they were asking for, who had been thrown into prison for rebellion and murder. He handed Jesus over to their will. Have you ever wondered why Jesus had to endure what he endured? As I look at the story of Jesus, I would describe his story as a tragic triumph. Because if you know the end of the story, there is triumph. Jesus rose again from the dead, and so he won the victory over sin. But yet at the same time, there was so much tragedy that led into it. So why did it have to be that way? Like Why couldn't Jesus just show up as the Son of God, defeat all his enemies, establish his kingdom, and then live happily ever after? Why did he have to endure so much? We're going to talk about the what for a little bit, but I don't want us to miss the why. Because again, it's the why that can change our lives. As those religious leaders brought Jesus before Pilate, the first thing that we read in the beginning of chapter 23 is that they brought three different accusations against him. Three false claims were brought against Jesus. The first, that he was misleading the nation. Now, this was a charge that is clearly nothing more than just a lie. Uh, The idea was that he was... uh, would go around in some sense as an insurrectionist, maybe spreading uh, this claim that, of just talking about how bad Rome was all the time. And we have no evidence at all in the Gospels that Jesus ever did that. Now, politically speaking, at this point in history, there was a great deal of, of turmoil taking place in Israel and around Israel. For one, the Roman Empire wasn't nearly as strong as it once was. And then in Israel, bubbling just beneath the surface, was this movement of people that were looking to gain freedom for Israel, to get out out from under Roman rule. Pilate knew that. And so Pilate, as the Roman official that was in charge of the region around Jerusalem, his utmost concern was making sure that didn't happen. And so that's part of the reason that they bring this charge against him. I mean, Jesus is out misleading the nation. He's stirring up all of these people. But again, there is no evidence of that. The second charge is that he opposed paying taxes to Caesar. Now, I believe that this is, at best, a clear misrepresentation of what Jesus said. Because we actually have a conversation recorded for us in the Gospels related to the paying taxes to Caesar. Some of the religious leaders and the scribes, they went to Jesus and asked him these big theological questions in order to trap him. Right? That's, that was the intent. And so they asked him what he thought about paying taxes to Caesar. 
And again, this was another one of those political hot button issues around Israel because there was a lot there were a lot of people who vehemently opposed paying taxes to Rome. It was uh, something that they did not ever want to do. But Jesus' response when asked the question, how do you feel about paying taxes to Caesar, was render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now there's a way in which you could maybe interpret the words of Jesus and say, well, render to Caesar what is Caesar's means giving him nothing because nothing is Caesar's and everything is God's. But yet at the same time, I think that that's a clear misrepresentation of the purpose of Jesus. The third charge that was brought against Jesus was that he claimed to be king. Now, there's a sense in which this one is true. But yet at the same time, it clearly misunderstands the purpose of Jesus coming and the scope of his kingdom. Because is Jesus a king? Well, yes, I would say that he is the king of kings and lord of lords, but his kingdom is not of this world. It's far bigger than anything that Rome was at the time and not necessarily something that even Rome needed to worry about. And so Pilate is listening to these accusations that are brought against Jesus. And he says, I find no fault in him. And at this point, as I read through the text, I stop and I say, man, I wish we knew more. I wish we had more of the details. Because in that first trial scene, really, it's pretty simply stated for us. Pilate asks Jesus this question, hey, are you a king? And he says, you say so. And then Pilate says, I don't find anything wrong with him. He's he's done nothing that's worthy of death. But yet at the same time, you know there had to be so much more. What was that conversation like? Did Pilate ask Jesus about his life and his ministry, the things that he taught? Did Pilate share with Jesus the difficult position that he was in, recognizing the political turmoil of the day? We don't really know. But what we find is that when Pilate found out that Jesus was a Galilean, he thought he had his way out. I'll just send him to Herod. See, Jesus being from Galilee, Galilee was in the northern part of the region of Palestine. And Pilate's jurisdiction didn't extend to Galilee. That was where Herod was in charge of. And it just so happened that as a result, because this was the Passover season, Herod was also in Jerusalem. And so Pilate thought, man, this is great. I will hand him over to Herod and he can do something about it. Herod was smart, though. Herod knew that he didn't actually have to do anything. He didn't have to make a decision related to Jesus because of where the accusations were made and the fact that the Sanhedrin was making these accusations. But yet at the same time, he was really excited about seeing Jesus. He'd heard a lot about Jesus, and so he was anticipating possibly getting Jesus to perform some kind of miracle for him, like he was a sideshow act. So then we begin to read some more about the accusations that are made. And Herod asks Jesus questions, but he refuses to perform a miracle. In fact, he refuses to say anything. But then we read that Herod treated him with contempt, mocked him, put a robe on him as if he were the king, and sent him back to Pilate. And so that we enter into the third trial scene, Jesus back in front of Pilate again, and Pilate still believing that Jesus didn't do anything that was worthy of death, but yet, as we read in the third scene, he's got a problem on his hands because there's a mob that is growing outside who, in their mind, they want justice, which means Jesus' death. And so Pilate says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have him beaten, and then I will release him. But the crowd was not satisfied. They keep shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And ultimately, Pilate acquiesced to the demands of the people and sentenced Jesus to be crucified. So what did Jesus endure? He was mocked, beaten, betrayed, and ultimately, he was crucified. 
That's what Jesus endured. But the important question for us to answer is why? Knowing what Jesus did, it's really important, but yet at the same time, knowing why, that's what can change our lives. Why did Jesus endure what he endured? Why was Jesus' story this tragic triumph? Why couldn't it be a triumph without the tra- tragedy? He endured what he endured because of sin. And I think this is something that we may have lost sight of in our world. Just how significant our sin is. Sin, simply defined, is missing the mark. And so if God's standard is perfection, every time that we do something that is less than perfect, it is sin. And we could look and, and at the world that we live in and where there is brokenness or dysfunction in the world around us, it is either sin or it's the result of sin. So anytime that something doesn't work the way that we think it ought to work or we know it ought to work, it is either sin or the result of sin. So think about this, like disunity, brokenness in relationships, or even just disharmony in relationships, anything that creates that disharmony is sin. Anger, which can create disharmony in relationships, sin. Jealousy is sin. Anytime that we begin to find our identity in how others view us, it's sin. Because we're meant to find our identity in how God views us and in that relationship. Anytime that we sense that God is saying, here's what I want you to do, or here, we read in the Bible, like, here's what it means to be obedient to God, and we do something else, that's sin. And see, I think we've lost the significance of sin. Because we tend to focus on God's love and forgiveness. And so sometimes we think to ourselves, well, it's not that big of a deal if I do something that I want to do and not what God wants me to do, because in the end, God will forgive me. We can fall into the trap of thinking that way when we lose sight of the significance of our sin. See, the apostle Paul said in the book of Romans, he said it this way, should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? I'll give a paraphrase. Should we go on sinning because we know God's going to forgive us anyway? Again, my paraphrase to what Paul said. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But when we lose sight of the serious nature of our sin, we can think that way. We do have a tendency to focus on God's love and God's grace. But what we don't understand is that when we sin... There is a sense in which we are saying, God, you aren't who you think you are. Because God is the sovereign ruler of the universe and in charge of everything. And when we sin, so when we say, okay, this is what God wants me to do, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. We are in a sense saying, God, you might think that you're sovereignly in control of everything, but you are not going to be in control of me. I will be the God of my own life. And what that does, whether we understand it or not, or whether we are consciously aware of it or not, that makes us enemies of God and underneath God's wrath. And that's not something that we like to talk about. We focus on God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness. But God is also a God of justice and wrath. But the only reason that we can be forgiven and we can talk about God's love and his grace is because God's wrath has been satisfied. That's why Jesus did what he did. That's why he endured the suffering and pain that he endured was to satisfy the wrath of God so that we could be forgiven. Now, there's a part of the passage I haven't really touched on yet, and that is the role of Barabbas. So in the third trial scene, Pilate is thinking, okay, I'll have Jesus whipped, that'll satisfy the people, and then I will release him. Because during the Passover, there was this tradition of a criminal being released. 
And so we read about Barabbas. The people begin shouting, no, release to us Barabbas. Barabbas was someone who was an insurrectionist. So he led a rebellion, and then he was also guilty of murder. And when we read this trial scene of Jesus, we should begin to read ourselves into the story of Barabbas. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I think Barabbas was a real person who did real things. But yet at the same time, as we begin to understand the symbolism of what is being presented to us, as we read this event, we should read ourselves into the place of Barabbas. Because what we have in the trial of Jesus is an innocent man who did nothing wrong, but he died in the place of a rebellious murderer. And we are the ones, as a result of our sin, who are leading in or participating in a rebellion against God. But somebody in the person of Jesus was willing to lay down his life for us, died in our place because of what we did wrong, not because of what he did wrong. That's why Jesus endured what he endured. So maybe you're beginning to see it for the very first time, the significance of why Jesus did what he did, because he died in our place. What was meant for us, the punishment that was meant for us, Jesus took that upon himself so that we didn't have to. He died so that we could be set free. And there's nothing that we could ever do on our own to become free. We couldn't earn our salvation. There's nothing that we could do to work for it. We would never deserve it, but that's why Jesus died in our place for us. He died to be enough for us. We read these words in Romans 5, uh, Romans 5, 21, so just as sin reigned through death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, Jesus is enough when we could never be. Now, something really significant happens when we come to faith in Jesus, and I want you to understand this too. So it's not just when we trust Jesus as our Savior, believing that he died in our place for our sins. It is not just that our sins are forgiven. That happens. But when we come to faith in Jesus, God begins to view us differently. Not just as people who do all these bad things and are forgiven of those things, but when we come to faith in Jesus, his righteousness, he never did anything wrong. All he ever did was right. His righteousness is credited to us so that God begins to see us not just as somebody who hasn't done things wrong, but he sees us as people who have always gotten everything right. That's what Jesus accomplished for us. And that's incredible to think about, that God views us not as people who just haven't done anything wrong, but as people who have always gotten everything right. And listen, I will tell you, that's not me. That's not us. But that's the righteousness of Jesus that reigns in our lives. See, understanding the why changes everything. If all we know is the what, I think it's really easy to just end up in a place where we go through the motions of our faith. We say the right things. We may do a lot of the right things, but when it comes down to it, we often find ourselves in a position where we say, I'd rather do what I want to do. But when we understand the significance of why Jesus laid down his life for us, because he loved us so much that he wanted us to be in a relationship with God that lasts forever. He endured pain and suffering because of the serious nature of our sin so that we could have eternal life. When we truly understand why Jesus endured what he endured, that awakens our faith, which should cause us to say, why would I ever want to do anything else other than live for the one who laid down his life for me and rescued me from my sin and has given me eternal life? See, the what's really important. But it is the message of why. That's what can change our lives. And I pray that that is the case for all of us. As we understand the why, that our faith would be awakened and it would begin to guide everything that we do. We pray with me, Heavenly Father. 
Thank you so much for your love and your grace. May we understand the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus who endured pain and mockery and suffering, and he did it for us. Because we were your enemies, but he laid down his life in our place so that by faith in him and trusting in him, we could become your sons and daughters, rescued and set free, given a relationship with you that lasts forever. And Father, I pray as we understand the why, that our faith would be awakened and we would say with everything that we have, God, help me to know how to live, to please and honor the one who gave himself for me. May that be true of all of us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.